Turn to Matthew 6, verses 19 through 24, and pray the Spirit of God will really speak to our hearts tonight from the Word of God. Now, this service is just as important as any service, no matter who's here. And, of course, uh, a lot of people get concerned about the number of people that's there. Listen, folks, when I started out preaching, I started out with a congregation of 32 people. And uh, that was my first church. So God never promises us but one thing. He will meet us where we are if we're hungering to hear from God. And I want to hear from Him tonight, and I know that you do. And all we want to do is let God speak to us. Hungry people, thirsty people, just desiring to hear from God. Matthew 6 and verse 19. If I can find it, I'm in Jeremiah. Oh, boy. Now you know why I've got to cut back. Matthew 6 and verse 19. And pray the Spirit of God to speak while I bring the Word, if I can find it. All right. Now look at verse 19. Lay not up for yourself treasures upon earth where moth, and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, or where thieves break through or steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness. No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he'll hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon, or deceitful riches, or money. I didn't get to finish when I was here before on the messages that I brought, so God just opened the door where I could preach the last one. Amen. And you say, well, why pick on us? I am not. It's the others that's just going to miss out. Amen. I tell people, don't ever, don't ever judge yourself by people that are not here. Feel sorry for them that they weren't there, because they're the ones who will probably miss hearing from God what they need to hear. So I don't ever feel like I need to stay home. I feel like I don't want to miss what God's got to say to me in that service on that night. So pray as I bring the Word and ask God to open our hearts to not only he hear the Word, but to hear it and hearken to it, that it may assimilate it and it become a lifestyle as we live out the Christian life. We were all startled here the night. I was up about 5 in the morning, a little before 5, and flipped on the TV and that was the news that princes die. And we've heard so much about it, I'm sure you don't want to hear any more. But when I heard that she had been killed, it was startling to me. I could not believe it. The first thing that went through my mind, first of all, I wonder if she was really saved. That's always what goes through a Christian's mind. It would be no matter who it is. It doesn't mean you're judging. It just means that's the priority. What good is it to live in this world and profit your life and ne lose your soul without God? That's the tragedy of human existence. Amen? You know, we've just about forgotten there is a hell and that people still go there and there's not much preaching about it. But the first thing that dawned on me, out of all of her money and out of all of his money, I wonder how much that they had ever thought about they needed to invest in getting people to Jesus. That never seemed to cross people's minds. Many, many people say to me, it doesn't matter. I just pray she was born again. I, I know he was a Muslim. I don't have, have much chance for him. And I'll just tell you, uh, Muslims cannot be saved if they're true Muslims. Amen. Well, you might well say, amen, it's truth anyway. Why? Because they do not believe that Jesus Christ is the divine Redeemer and the virgin-born Son of God and the only one who can take our sins away. And somehow when you say those things, people think you're not tolerant. Come on, folks. The Word of God's right. And we've got to be as narrow as the Word of God. Jesus said, I'm the only way. 
Not a way, not some way. I'm the way. No other way, excluding all others that do not believe that he is the Lamb of God. So I just have to tell you, I don't have much hope for that. And I'll tell you what, folks. You think about an individual dying in that condition. And in an instant, after enjoying the luxury of this world, walking into the pits of the damned, lost without God, forever separated from Jesus, never again ever hearing any hope whatsoever, forsaken of God in eternity without Jesus, that ought to be the first thought of every one of our hearts. Not that we're any better, but oh, thank God we've heard the gospel, and we came to Jesus, and we're born again, and we know who holds tomorrow. Hallelujah for Jesus Christ. But here in the Matthew chapter 6, Jesus is dealing with the Pharisees. He's already dealt with three areas of the Pharisees in Matthew 6 when he deals, first of all, with their almsgiving. If you look at chapter 6 and verse 1, he deals with their giving. He said, why do you want to give and then pray it before people, blow the trumpet, and then show people how much giving you have done? What he's really saying, it's a sin to be a hypocrite. God hates hypocrisy. And he deals with it in a matter of giving. And there's so many people who can be hypocritical in giving. I know so many people who would be glad to give if they can always be bragged on or given a plaque or a building named after them. I, always, <laughs> I never had a, had a building. I do have. I've got a little building over at Lupton Drive Baptist Church that's got my name on it. The names are about that big on Stafford Annette. <laughs> that's the best I'll ever get. Amen. But let me tell you something, friends. The Pharisees were so externally religious that when they gave, they wanted to get all their glory right then and wanted everybody to know what they had given. And Jesus said, that's a hypocrite. Secondly, he dealt with their prayer life. And he said, do your praying in secret. They that pray in secret, God will reward openly. Learn a, the power of a secret closet prayer life. Then he dealt with their fasting. Today we're seeing so many preachers get up and preach a certain thing that they've done that seems to make them spiritual. I, we have a big movement going on about fasting now. I got right tickled when I found out when I was in Arkansas that the, all the men I knew that fasted for 40 days just really fasted on just water. That's all. That was a true fast. I know J. Harold Smith has fasted many times just on water. And that's all for 40 days. But come to find out, they, they take vegetables, put them in a blender, and whip them up and make it juice, and they drink that. Well, my Lord, just go ahead and eat the vegetables. Amen? Why be a hypocrite? Why, amen? Why run around and act like you hadn't had anything? And here these poor old preachers are leaving after he's given his testimony, and they're out yonder trying their best to fast on water. Because he didn't tell them, we whipped up vegetables and made it juice, and it sustained us. You see, we got so much of this. You see, my problem and your problem is we always want people to think we're just a little bit more spiritual than what we are. That's why we won't tell it all. <laughs> uh, hello? I don't believe you're here tonight. I've done run your number three times, and you haven't picked up the receiver yet. I'm telling you, we need to be true about our life. Don't put on a front. Jesus hates hypocrisy. I just picked this up. I had this in some notes. I had a message I preached years ago, and I just saw this thing on hypocrisy. There's no folly in the world so great as to be a hypocrite. The hypocrite is hated of the world for seeming to be a Christian. He's hated by God for not being one. He hates himself and is even despised by Satan for serving him and not acknowledging it. <laughs> Hypocrites are really the best followers and the greatest dupes that Satan has. They serve him better than any other but receive no wages. And what is most wonderful, they submit to greater mortification to go to hell than most sincere Christians do to go to heaven. They'll do anything in the world to try to make sure that they are projecting a spiritual image. 
And Jesus spoke so much about it. He said, you make the inside of the cup so dirty, and you make the outside look so good. Oh, you hypocrites. One old boy said to me, he said, Brother Bill, I know you're not a hypocrite because it means two-faced. And if you were, you'd be wearing the other face. Now that hurts. Amen. Jesus hated hypocrisy. This is what he's dealing with. And he comes to chapter 9, uh, verse 19. Here's what he says. You Pharisees think if you got money, or you're a little wealthy, a little better home, and you got a little savings account, and you begin to live a little extra rich, you think that's spirituality. And they were governing their spirituality by their wealth. But how many ministers do we see now that the more they move along in the ministry, the more they start moving away from a balanced ministry of poor, middle class, and rich, and start moving only to a rich ministry. They can only minister to people who are wealthy, are rich, are the higher class. And ladies and gentlemen, no church can survive as a New Testament church that hadn't got all kinds of people in its congregation. And the glory of a church is when a multimillionaire has to sit by a poverty-stricken man in church and boast up both of them together, children of the king, singing the songs of Zion. And you can't tell one from the other. That's a spiritual New Testament godly church. The Pharisees were saying, I'm rich, I'm wealthy, I got more money, so that makes me somebody. Ladies and gentlemen, how do we triumph over this? How can we live in America with all of its luxury and have triumph over materialism? How can we have things and not become so scared? I have people to say to me, Brother Bill, I don't want any more than what I got. I'm afraid it'll ruin me spiritually. Folks, money don't ruin you. It's our attitude toward it. I want to see how much I can give away before Jesus comes. Amen? Is there anything wrong with that? Well, Brother Bill, I'll tell you one thing. I just feel like that it would ruin me. Ladies and gentlemen, money doesn't have a personality. It can't ruin you. You was ruined before you got it. Money just made it surface. <laughs> I'm going to have to get down here. Boy, it's getting tougher and tougher. Hey, are you hearing me? Hey, hey, listen, when I was coming up in the ministry, people, I'm not in my outline yet. I've got an outline, so just hold still, Rick. I'm going to give it to you in just a moment. But anyway, when I was in the early ministry and so poor, listen to me. Oh, Lord, mercy. $35 a week, that's what we made. Gave 20% of that back to the church. Lived on $27 a week. And that's the way we lived. But the joy of watching God meet our needs was where you build that early ministry of knowing that if God can trust me with nothing for years, there might come a time when you'll make me a center of distribution and a warehouse so I can pour out money to ministries for the cause of Christ. Woo! Amen? Anything wrong with that? Listen to me. The sad thing about the Pharisees they bragged about their giving, but they only gave to glorify their self-gratification. They never gave because they had a broken heart, or a passion for God, or a love for souls, or because many women were going to hell and they didn't want them to. They never gave because they were moved and broken over somebody's condition. They only gave to get glory to themselves, and that's a sin against God. How do I triumph over this and yet not be afraid of money or afraid of riches or afraid of a nice house or afraid of a nice car? I, God don't care if you drive a Rolls Royce with hinges in the middle to turn a curve. If your giving's right, if you're honoring God with what you're... I thought a princess died. I think... Uh, What's her, uh, Doty, whatever he was? I think he got $100,000 a month just to live on from his dad. Just a playboy. Didn't have to do nothing. But what a tragedy to have all of that and call it living. And now, probably in hell without a dime. Broke before God. Lost without God. Probably any, probably never will, never, uh, not, I don't, let me get this straight. Probably would give the world, 
If you could hear a song one more time, a preacher one more time, an invitation one more time. But ladies and gentlemen, it is not enough to have things and not let Jesus control them. Only Jesus can make me godly and yet not be afraid of having things. Amen? Now, here we go. First thing he deals with, look at it, his attitude toward possessions. First of all, he says there's two kinds. There's, there's an attitude of earthly, there's an attitude of heavenly. He's not dealing with amounts, he's dealing with attitude. He's trying to change the Pharisee's attitude. What's he mean? Get your heart right. For where your treasure is, that's where your heart will be. We're not head people, we're heart people. We don't worship from our intellect. We worship from a revealed truth to our hearts, a living Christ who lives in us. That's where we worship from. We're heart people. We don't give because we got it figured out. We give because God spoke to us. Our heart's for Him. Our affection to Him. Our love is to Him. We give because God has spoken to our hearts. And here's what He said. If you're going to walk with me, you're going to have to get your attitude your heart right. And the Pharisees did not have a right heart. And they didn't have it because they didn't have Jesus living in them. What's their attitude toward possessions? Well, most of the time it's earthly. He said, what does it mean, lay not up treasures on earth? Well, it means that I have control of what God puts in my hands. I have a, I have a way in my will to either obey God with it and let Him lord it, or I can totally consume it of myself. Totally live for myself. Just get things for myself. More for myself. Me, my, and mine. I, I. Ladies and gentlemen, the tragedy in the church today is one of the greatest problems we have is our attitude toward possession. Do you know most of us worship people many times who are rich? Did you know a wealthy person can come on here and say, boy, hey, I've been sitting on the platform and a pastor turned to me and said, see that man who just came in? He owns 34 Burger Kings. Well, so what? You know? Uh, that ain't going to help me any because when I get through, he's not going to give anything anyway. So, uh, in fact, he probably won't be back. But anyway, it doesn't impress me that a man owns riches because wealth belongs to the Lord. He gives it and he takes it away. And if a man's got it, it's because God is the one that entrusted him with it. Why should we bow? Why don't we bow to the Social Security lady that gives 20% of her Social Security check? Why don't you ever get their names on something? Amen? I was in a place in Arkansas, and uh, they had a big, they had a big uh, gymnasium, family life center, and on the side of it was a man who gave half of the money to build it, and it's the only way he would give the money is to have his name put on the side. Very wealthy man. If I named what he owned, it would, it would, you'd know how wealthy he really is, but the only way he'll give anything is to have his name on the side. That's earth giving. Who cares where my name is if Jesus has let me give away? It's not his anyway. It's the Lord's. But we bow to that. We scrape and we say, and we, we say, oh, but Brother Bill, look what he's accumulated. But ladies and gentlemen, he's going to leave it all. They won't none of it go with him. And the sickening thing is, men and women many times will lay up everything they can on earth leave an endowment to some university or some school, and then they turn around and won't use it for the cause of Christ, or else it goes liberal, God wants you to control your giving. He wants you to do it by obedience, by will, by choice. Do it to the glory of God. Why? So you can lay up treasures in heaven. Well, why lay up treasures in heaven? So you'll have a good welcome, welcoming committee when you get there. Must I go and empty-handed? Must I go to, uh, must I 
traveled through the skies through flowery beds of ease, while others fought to win the prize and sailed through bloody seas. No, I must fight if I would reign. Increase my courage, Lord. I'll bear the toil, endure the pain, supported by thy word. Why should I go through the world living my own way, romping my way to heaven, and get to heaven and everything be rosy, when God has said, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. You see, laying up treasures in heaven means that I want to invest in every ministry I can that God lays on my heart so that when I get to glory, I won't have everything burned up here, I will have my dividends and investments there because I gave it to get people to glory and to get them saved by the grace of God. Heavenly investments. Eternal dividends. Let's look a moment. At first, look, at, uh, look at 1 Timothy chapter 6 for just a moment. 1 Timothy chapter 6. He has more to say about this. and Let's see what he says. And pray that the Spirit of God will really speak to us about this text. First Timothy chapter 6. Look at verse 19. The Bible says, Laying, I'm sorry, it's verse, uh, I knew that wasn't right. In verse 17, Charge them that are rich in this world, that they be not high-mended. What does that mean? Don't be conceited if you're a little better off than somebody else. Amen. Don't let things make you conceited. Have you ever watched TBN much? I hope not. If you have, ask God to forgive you. I have never heard such junk. The other night, listen, honest, honest for the Lord. My wife and I sat there, and I've had time to do this. Usually I'm in meetings, and I haven't got time for all this, but I just watched. Ladies and gentlemen, for two hours, I sat there and scrutinized. I watched. And I want you to know something. It'll make you sick at your stomach at the way preachers are literally slaughtering the Word of God. Don't even read a text. And one preacher stood there, and if you all know who he was, I'll tell you for not getting enough votes. But anyway, one preacher said, I've seen the devil twice in my life. Once he tried to kill me. I never heard him say anything that the devil, devil would be bothered about. And I listened to him for 45 minutes, and he never said anything to tear the devil up, I promise you. Why? He never said anything about the Word, never said anything about what, what, the, what the promises are. He ne Why? He talked about himself. Watch out for a preacher who's the hero of his own preaching. Did you hear me? Watch out for a preacher who's the hero of his own preaching. Listen. I listened to him, and here's what he said. I saw the devil twice. Once he tried to kill me. The second time, he told me he was going to take away my ministry. I said, well, Lord, he ought to. <laughs> Amen. You know what he said for 45 minutes? I'm anointed. I've seen the devil. God walked down and talked to me visibly this morning. I never heard such junk in my life, which proves to me he's a false prophet. And yet, made... Fifty million dollars last year. And you let me tell you something, ladies and gentlemen. I may have to answer for a lot of things, but one thing I won't have to answer for in 45, 46 years of preaching, I have never had to beg, bum, or, or plead poverty. My Heavenly Father has watched over me. I think I'll have a spell right there. Do you mind? Why? I trust in God. I know He cares for me. O'er mountains bleak, or over stormy sea, though billows roll, He keeps my soul. My Heavenly Father watches over me. Ladies and gentlemen, God doesn't have to have false prophets and fake motivation and guilt trips to get His work done. He owns it all. 
He's ready to take somebody and transfer them through them the needs that will be met and make you a center distribution and a warehouse for the glory of God that our money may literally be laying up treasures in heaven. By the way, the word treasures comes from the word where we get our word thesaurus. It means to stockpile. You know what a thesaurus? <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know what a is? You know what a thesaurus is? That's a stockpile of synonyms and anonyms. That's what it is. That's where all the preachers go to get their alliterations. They go and find a word, and that's not the right one, so they look for a synonym. And when they find it, they say, I ain't so dumb. Amen. But anyway, and they get alliteration. They got A, 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 B, 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 C, 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 D, D, D. You know, it's got to be that way. Jesus said, don't be caught hoarding. What is hoarding? Wanting more than you need. Have you ever walked into a home and drive up to it? Monster. I've been in some monsters. I was in, I was in uh, Orlando Wilson's home, stayed in his home. C CNN, bass fisherman. Hey, Stay at 14,000 square feet. Now, folks, listen, that's a big house. I stayed there three days and never saw anybody. <laughs> Thank God. But I'm like Uncle Bud Robinson, the old Nazarene preacher who spoke with a lift. Uncle Bud went to New York, first time he'd ever been anywhere. Just no country. Didn't graduate from the third grade till he was 17. And Uncle Bud was just a count meeting Nazarene preacher, became the greatest preacher the Nazarene movement ever heard, ever had as a count meeting. Uncle Bud said, Hey, I went to New York and saw them big old buildings, and I stood there and said, My soul, I have never seen the like in my life. But he said, When I walked away from it, I didn't see a thing that I wanted. That's the way it is. When your eyes are turned on Jesus, the only thing you want is what? Is God entrusting me for His glory? I want nothing in my life that will cause me not to bring glory and honor to the name of the Lamb of God. The attitude toward possession. Then secondly, we see the effect it has on perception. Look at this. The Bible says that the lamp of the body is the eye. The lamp of the body is the eye in Matthew 6. If thine eye be healthy are single, are clear, is translated different ways. If thine eye be healthy, single, or clear, then he says, that brings spiritual light. But if thine eye be greedy, or evil, if thine eye be sick, it clouds the window of perception, causes us not to hear the word of God, and suddenly darkness comes. And instead of having light, we have darkness. And here, here's what I want you to see. These are very important, folks. Listen to me. We have people come to church all the time and hear the Word of God, but they never hear the God of the Word. They've got a lot of truth in their head, but nothing in their hearts. They walk away just like they were when they came. Never a changing reality of obedience. Now listen to this. Two things are listed. The, the root word for clear or for, or for healthy is generous. H-A-P-L-O-U-S. That's the word. It means generous. That's the root word. Generous. If thine eye be generous. What is he saying? Show me a man who is generous and is a man full of generosity and I'll show you a man who will keep hearing and receiving the light of God when he hears the Word. <clears throat> I don't think God blesses some ministries because of great preaching. I think He blesses some people just because they dare to do what He says. I think of one little preacher said he walked into a house one night and come to find out the man was a good friend of the governor's and they, he, he was such a soul winner that, and this was years ago, that the man called the governor and said, hey, well, we'd like to come and have dinner with you and I want you to know this man. And, 
He said, when I walked in and saw the governor, since I was just a little five-foot man, a little humped, didn't look like much, the governor looked kind of strange at me until I looked at him and said, it's strange what God uses, isn't it? Do you know we get so spiritual? We think we know it all about whom God can use. Do you know who God really uses? Is the person who bears himself to God and dares to do what he says. And he'll wear you out for his glory. And here it is. If I keep on receiving, it's going to be because of generosity. I'm handling treasures right. I'm not letting them possess me. My heart's in the church. My heart's in the gospel. My heart's in missions. My heart's in the choir. My heart's in getting people to Jesus. My whole heart is, is glorifying God. That's where my heart is. My whole being is wrapped up in pleasing Jesus. If so, I'll be generous. And if I'm generous, I keep... Re I have never seen a person who was generous ever become a problem in the church because their heart's in it. They may have an opinion, but they'll never be a problem. I've never seen a choir member ever be a problem who was generous. But you let a tightwad get in there, and you got problems. He'll make a problem. If you got some, I'm going to pray for you. Amen. Now, secondly, if thine eye be evil. What's he saying? If a man's greedy, he clouds his perception. I don't care what you preach, he'll never hear you. And because of his attitude... Whatever you preach will come at him in such a way that by the time he receives it, he's already rebelled. He's already mad. He's not right with God. He wants you to do something for him, but he won't repent himself. And he sits there, and by the time the truth gets to him, his rebellion has already twisted it to where when it hits him, it comes as darkness. I had folks I pastored for 12 years that I never saw them ever respond to the truth of God. I never saw them weep over a soul. I never saw them ever get involved. I never saw them fall in love with Jesus. All they ever got involved in was some kind of gossip, some kind of ridicule. Some Listen, they could pick up a stink 50 miles away, but never weep over a soul. Always in the middle of turmoil and problems. Amen. What kind of people were they? Self-centered, self-gratification, self pity, self-praise. Just let me be the center of attraction. That's what we've got. What's, what's wrong with people like that? Greedy people can never hear the word correctly. Their attitude, their disposition, the way they've responded in rebellion and the way they're mad or bitter or unconfessed sin. It can be a lot of things. Attitude towards somebody. Not making it right with somebody. Pride, ego, bitterness, resentment. All of that can cause you, when you hear the Word, to cause the Word to come at you. And if you're bitter and resentful, you are twisted to where when the Word comes, it doesn't bless you. It literally turns to darkness and makes you worse than you were when you heard it. Because you have twisted it to darkness. All of it's got to do with treasures. Possessions. I mean, really, if you, if you want to get in trouble, you want to get somebody mad at you, you just start preaching some of this stuff. Well, he's a money preacher. <laughs> I love to hear it. Uh, hey, I better not say that. I better sift through that one. Okay, I'll pass that one by for the moment. We do a lot of stuff in Australia, which has a big British influence. We do a lot in South Africa, as you know, since Brother Wayne's gone with me. Lord, when we got back this time after 34,000 miles, we agreed not to even look at each other for six weeks. After traveling together so long. I, listen, I was laying there asleep one night, and I turned over and looked, and that looked like an elephant beside me. And I decided I was never going to sleep again. Amen. I told him that, by the way. In fact, there ain't much we don't tell each other. But, but listen, the saddest thing in the world is knowing that the very thing we can use for the glory of God, we have turned into gods to mass and hoard and keep. And instead of being people who want to be hilarious givers, 
We're people who are wanting to accumulate, and the world has set its program on us. The system is locking its into its mold. And more and more as we get toward the second coming, we're watching people regulate their lifestyle more by the economy than they do by the sinful, corrupt condition of a nation. Tragedy after... Listen, I can live with a lesser house. I can live with a lesser car. And I can live with a lot of other things. But we can't live with sin abounding on every side. We must have revival. Amen? We must. What's your attitude toward possessions? It affects your perception. Then last, the affections that it produces. Listen to this, and I'm through. No man can serve. By the way, the word serve there means more than just an employer to an employee. It has to do with a bond servant. That's what the word means. And you know all about bond servants. But I want to tell you it means that a man who is a bond servant is 100% loyal to the man that owns him. You know, people come up to me after I preach this and say, Well, I work eight hours a day. I'm faithful to my employer. Then I got time to be loyal to something else. I said, You missed the whole word of God, brother. The word here is not employer, employee that works 9 to 5 or 8 to 4.30. It is a bond servant who's been bought by his master. And he is totally, 100%, the possession of his master. He has no rights. He's merely a thing as far as the world's concerned because he has no rights. He belongs to another. I get right tickled when I preach on this and a lot of... A lot of conferences, a lot of people come to me and say, Well, Brother Bill, I don't think God's interested in money. He's interested about Him being Lord. I said, No. Here, He's talking about your car. He's talking about your home. He's talking about your bank account. He's talking about your investments. He's talking about your dividends. He's talking about your sharing and loving and being a person who has one desire, and that's to give to others that they may be blessed. And by the way, let me tell you something else. You will never be full of Jesus until you can rejoice in other people's prosperity. Amen. Now y'all sit here and look at me like that. Why don't you say amen? Well, do this. You don't say amen. I know we don't do that much around here, but I try to whip up one once in a while. But hey, I find out what envy is. Envy is when your neighbor drives in with a new Mercedes. And you've been wanting one. <laughs> oh, well, let's get up. I didn't go over so hot either. Let's go a little further. Here, look here. Look at, the, look at the affections. Love, hate. That's affections. You see, even a man that's lost has to... I mean, even a Christian who is not sold out to God is still worshiping a master. And money and possessions is a great slave, but a poor master. And when people are mastered by possessions, all they study is how can I have more? How can I get more? How can I accumulate more? How can my kids have more? How can I give them an Ivy League education? How can I give them the best? Have you ever seen these bumper stickers on cars that says my child is an honor student at certain school? You know, I'm going to get me one. My grandchild made an F, but he can whip the daylights out of your honor student. You know, that's about the kind I want. <laughs> wow. <laughs> you know what they've done? They probably beat the daylights out of the poor kid if they didn't make it because their parents want to excel in their excellence. Amen. I tell you one thing I like for my kids to do and my grandkids is have an A with Jesus. An A-plus, walking with God, be an honor student in the Holy Ghost. And I want all my kids to be givers, givers, hilarious givers. Why? Because if a man loves possessions, he'll hate God. Read it. If a man loves possessions, lives for, for possessions, honors possession, driven to possessions, he'll literally... Well, is that what it says? If you love the one, you're what? Hey, there's no neutrality. Am, am I right? 
Folks, now come on, don't sit there. Look at me one time and listen to me. There's not one bit of neutrality here. He's a bond slave. He belongs to his master 100%. No rights. He's merely possessed with a master. Everything belongs to him. No neutrality. And yet, here's what God says. If a person will not let me control possessions, they will hate my work. Oh, that don't mean you're going to walk around with your fist, but it means in your actions you deny that you're a bond servant. The biggest battles I'm through, the biggest battles I've had in my life is being a tight one is possessions. One of the biggest battles I've had in my life. I start out with nothing, you know. Back in those early days at Clearview Baptist Church in Boynton, Georgia. I sold how we loved Jesus. Didn't care. And I remember when our kids would get sick. We had already had, let's see. Let's see. Bill, how old are you? Uh, well, no, you don't have to tell. I'm sorry. I'm, I know you don't. But anyway, I'll guess at it here in a minute. I got so many kids and grandkids, I don't know how old they are. All I know is they're catching up with me. Hey, listen. I remember... Now, we had three at that time when it's a clear view. I remember... Listen to me. When my kids would get sick, and because we only made... To come out with $28 a week, and lived in that little pastor I already told you about, we had no money for a doctor, and I wasn't preacher enough. Then, you know, when you get to be a certain level of preacher, you just got... Doctors everywhere. I got three doctors on the board. I mean, I don't have to buy no medicine. I just call them up and say, hey, shoot me some up here real fast. I mean, hey, but I didn't have it then. Didn't have it then. But listen to me. My wife and I would take James 5. You say, well, this is not right. Well, it worked. Amen. Amen. We took James 5, and I would go in there. I didn't know him with oil, but I just prayed the Word of God. And we were so poor that we slept them on stack beds. And they were cheap, and it was narrow, and they didn't need much room anyway. We just stacked them up. And we'd lay our hands on those kids and say, Lord, they've got bronchopneumonia nearly. No telling what all's wrong with them. We don't have any money. We can't go to the doctor. But you are the one that put us in this business. And you said you'd take care of us. And we're going to either thank you, you're going to let us have the money, or you're going to heal our kids. And I want to tell you, I've watched the Holy God move into a bedroom when kids' temperature was 102. And their bodies were literally red and shaking because their temperature had gone so high. And on our knees before God, I watched the Holy God move in that bedroom and heal those kids in an instant. We didn't put them before the church next Sunday and brag about a miracle. Why? That's not the way it goes. But out of desperation... Knowing that you love God. And by the way, I just love Jesus. I didn't care. I just wanted to preach. I just wanted to praise God. I just wanted to love Him. I didn't give a rip. Just love Jesus. That's all I care. And yet, then you start reaching a place in your ministry. Success. Invitations. Bible conferences. Southern Baptist Convention. And the next thing you know, you begin to forget. Stay where you came from, buddy. Remember, the same God that lets you be a center of distribution will only let you stay there as long as He's master of your life. And while Sue was in the hospital, I remembered that. And I sat there with her all day long on Saturday, just read. Just sat there. She is on a 
morphine. She didn't even know how to round. You know, they give me this little pump, you know. If you have pain, just pump it. I, I thought she was half asleep. But the next thing I know, I hear it go, beep, 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 beep. And then she got another shot of morphine. I said, Lord, help give me one. If it's, if it's all that, great. But I laid my hands on her while she didn't even know it. And Brother Chuck, I said, Lord Jesus, I trusted you back yonder. I couldn't afford insurance. You worked. I've got insurance now, and I want to thank you for it. But would you still work a miracle in my wife? And let us see the supernatural work of God in her healing. Because I still believe he's the God that heals. I don't believe in healing lines. I don't believe in throwing crutches around and wheelchairs down the aisle. But I do believe there is a real ministry in the church that if somebody is in that desperate of shape, it's the church that ought to be called together and believe God to work a miracle or else meet the need to his boy. Amen? Are you hearing me? How can we do that? Just get back to realizing he's my master. Amen. Well, I've gone long, I guess. I love you. You're my church. You're my friends. I believe in you. I believe in my preacher. I believe in my church. I believe in what God's going to do in this place. Somewhere, sometime. I believe we're going to see a manifestation of Holy Ghost revival. Amen. I believe we're seeing spurts of it now. But I believe somewhere down the line, we're going to see a moving of God. Because we've got so much faith going on around us. I believe God's going to let us see the genuine. Amen. Let's stand. Every head bowed, every eye closed.